I would talk very briefly about why and how we grade economic freedom, and then why I think that's a particularly important tool in the time and place that we are today in this, in a controversy between free markets and economic freedom and, and what that means. So I'm not gonna lecture you on economic freedom because I think many of the students here are very familiar with the concept, and, which is really foundational to, to the university. So the Heritage Foundation, which is a, a major think tank in Washington, D.C., it's interesting because you know civil society everywhere is different. In the United States, it's particularly complex and interesting because we have a massive philanthropic uh, element in American, in American politics, and we've always had this notion of philanthropy. And what's almost uniquely American is it's philanthropy in our tradition and history is really extended to every single sector of society. So it's not just about helping the poor and, and or being for a political party, it's virtually every aspect of what we're engaged in, in in our human life can attract some element. And so Heritage is actually completely privately funded by individuals, there's several hundred thousand members that support the Heritage Foundation. And what makes it interesting for us is our work is, and we're not a, a political institution, we're conservative, Right, but we're not affiliated with a political party. But what it really means is all of our research and our findings and our ideas are our own, right? And we're not captured or, or, or beholden to any particular stakeholder. And, and as you know, particularly when you're discussing uh, economic freedom and economic theories, um, the, the notion of getting to the pure discussion of what is best for human flourishing and for communities and absent kind of the political spheres is really difficult. Um, it's, diff it's actually difficult in an academic setting often. It's very, very difficult in civil society where people have very specific outcomes that they want to push for, whether it's for their business or for their politics or their, for their community or for whatever. So not surprisingly, the Index of Economic Freedom, the first edition was in 1995. And if any of you were alive in 19, if your parents were alive in 19, come and show of hands, have people had parents that actually lived in 1995? Anybody? 1995, right? Was anybody born before 1995 here? You, you, nice try. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. Um, but, you know, obviously, you know, we're, that's several years after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. And, you know, probably one of the most dynamic, uh, periods of history in modern times, because literally like nobody was in charge. I mean, you know, a lot of times they call it the, the, you know, the unipolar world, as if America was like running the world, which it really wasn't, right? And, and really it was kind of a free for all. Um, if you actually go back and look at the data of the number of non-governmental organizations that were in the world before 1989 and after 1989, the growth is astronomical. And, and these NGOs were, were, were all running into filling the space of like, how do we organize things absent of this kind of massive dividing, you know, the world between, um, in the Cold War, between uh, the West and the Soviet Union. And the, this was particularly a relevant issue for, any, for the countries that were in the post-Soviet space. Um, maybe less so in Latin America, but if you were in, uh, if, if you were of your age in Romania or Poland or East Germany um, or any of the, you know, the, the post uh, Yugoslav states or, or the Czech Republic or, or at your age, and if you were alive in 1995, in all likelihood, you might have been a minister in government. You might have been a senior official. You might have been a political leader because, because the whole system had just collapsed. And these countries were just struggling to figure out, well, what is the path forward? And, 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 and if you, anybody who follows kind of European politics in here, you know there's tremendous diversity in there. You have countries like Estonia, which um, went on to becoming incredibly prosperous um, incredibly productive, really had some of the most modern governance systems um, in the entire world. You know, in the early years of the internet and, uh, uh, and digitalization of government, Estonia had the best government in the world. 
I mean, this is a country that didn't, wasn't even allowed to decide for itself anything. And, and, and five years later, they had, they had the most efficient government system uh, really on earth. And then other countries which, which never really kind of escaped a lot of the, the um, communist practices and were run by oligarchs and, and single party systems and everything else. But the idea of creating the index of economic freedom um, was obviously because Heritage as a conservative foundation um, and not a libertarian foundation. So we, you know, when we say it's our job to keep America free, safe, and prosperous, and you don't get credit for two out of three, it was, you know, you had to balance the equities of promoting a free society, protecting individual political liberties, and, and dealing with the hard security issues. And in the Cold War, balancing all three of those things, you know, was obviously very challenging. But when the Cold War ended, we, we were now faced with dealing with many nations around the world, which went from being an implacable enemy to being a potential friend. And the notion was, is how could we be helpful? So the idea of creating the Index of Economic Freedom was to create a structure to, to, for, for governments and, and, for, and for businesses and political parties to understand what was their level of economic freedom relative to each other and relative to an absolute standard. Now, why did we do that? Well, there's, there's all kinds of freedoms in the world. Um, there are political freedoms, you know, religious liberty, and there are all kinds of indexes for this. There's a, there's a freedom index, there are religious liberty indexes, there's human trafficking indexes. The, part of the reason why we chose economic freedom was because of all the different kinds of human activities, it was the one that was most quantitative and you could actually measure. Um, and there was an enormous body of, of not, not just economic theory, but political thought about what constituted the concept of economic freedom, as opposed to the idea of just making money. Right? So it's not, economic freedom is not about who's richest in the world. It's who's economically free. And what that means is basically having the opportunity to use your, the benefits of human flourishing for your own skills and talents and attributes to create the maximum good um, for, for yourself, for your family, for your community, for your country. And so um, if you look at the index of economic freedom, one of the, which is now I guess in our 25th or whatever plus year, um, what's, in, what's important about it is for all this time, we've graded everything exactly the same way. And that's really, really important because as many of you know, if you're doing trend analysis, if you're rebalancing every year or two, it's very, very difficult to say. It's easy to make progress when you get to give the report card out, right? So the idea was is finding a way to measure things that were consistent over time, even if they're imperfect, that, that's less important than the fact that at least you're measuring things in the same way. And, and to measure things that are relevant so there's a difference between counting what you can count and counting what matters. And so the, the original work, which I think is, is really worth, if you're interested in the whole concept and really digging into this, is the decision about what, what do you use to count to create a quantitative measure of economic freedom. And, 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 and obviously it's two things. One is it has to be measurable um, in, a, in, a, in a relevant way. The other is it has to be universal. Because if you're going to provide a relative index of, of, of economic freedom, including countries as diverse as North Korea and uh, Guatemala and the United States of America, you have to have data that's consistent across all of them. It has to be consistent over time, and it has to be relevant. So if you actually go through and look at the measurements in the index of economic freedom, the magic is really trying to hit things that could do that. And so obviously, what goes into economic freedom is not just gross economic productivity, because you could be incredibly wealthy and have very little economic freedom, um, as the Chinese models actually validated very effectively. So actually, if you look at the scores of China, which is by all measures now probably the second largest economy in the world, um, what's really interesting is if you look at the period in which China made the rapid transition between a developing nation and a rich and powerful nation, um, it, was, it was in the period of the greatest economic liberalization 
in China in modern times. So you could actually see in the index of economic freedom, its score started to go up as it got wealthier. And then, and then we all know that that really came to an end um, in the last decades. And China has focused much more on a, on a centralized economy. So they've maintained a certain level of wealth, although they have some serious structural economic problems. But if you actually look at their economic freedom scores, they've actually plummeted significantly. So here you have a country that's very wealthy, but also in terms of economic freedom, its scores are actually quite, quite low. And so that's why the index looks at things like um, property rights, rule of law, the ability to establish a business, public debt, uh, public regulatory burden, um, and levels of corruption. Uh, and, and the data on this is actually not bad. Uh, there, there's another major index, I won't name it, it's done by the Fraser Institute. It's fine, right? If you actually look at our results, they're, they're not perfectly synonymous, but they're, but they're fairly comparable, in part because we kind of use the same data. And not surprisingly, they produce the same results. Um, what's important to understand is, is what, the index, what, what a measure of economic freedom does and doesn't do for you. It is not a guide to the future. That's why I was asking about movies, because we were talking about this before. Is anybody watch Apple TV? Did they get that here? Is that a thing? Apple TV? No? Yes? Yes? Maybe some? Um, foundation? Yes. So, where? Yeah, yeah you, you've been watching it? Yeah. Right, OK. So you know what I'm talking about, right? So, um, so, so you know, this is, for those of you who don't know, this is a sci-fi series about a guy who commits a mathematical model that predicts the future. Right? So you know exactly what's going to happen. That is not the index of economic freedom. Right? You can get to a score of 100, and it doesn't mean that you're going to be free and safe and, and whatever. Right? Because it, economic freedom is not a measure of political freedom and other freedoms. Right? It's, and th they're obviously related, but they're not synonymous. And, and, and in, like anything, there is no, no single equity that, that can provide for a perfect and healthy society. So a perfect example is Hong Kong. We used to measure Hong Kong as a separate entity in the index of economic freedom. Because although they were part of China, they, under the basic law, they were allowed essentially to have a separate economic and political system. And even though Hong Kong never really had but what would you say would be a perfect democracy, for literally for almost the entire history of the index, they, they were the world's leader in economic freedom. Um, and uh, for a small, tiny island of people, they created an enormous amount of wealth and an enormous, actually, a very good quality of life. Um, that disappeared literally overnight. I mean, I remember going, I remember going to, to Hong Kong and having an official, who I went there for many, many years. As a matter of fact, Mike worked there. But I remember going and when um, a representative of the Hong Kong government came up to me and said, well, you can't say that. That will offend the Chinese. And that's when I knew that things were really going to change. And then literally in, in a span of, of really less than a few years, the Chinese abolished the basic law that allowed Hong Kong to have a separate system. And at that point, we actually took Hong Kong off the list of the index of economic freedom because they didn't, they didn't have freedom of choice anymore. They couldn't really make independent choices on the things in the index of economic freedom, like rule of law uh, and property rights. And therefore, even, even though theoretically, you know, Hong Kong was still Hong Kong, they didn't, they, they weren't. So all the economic freedom in the world didn't protect them from losing all their political rights in five minutes, because the Chinese just took it away. So um, economic, the index of economic freedom is really, it's a tool to help understand if, if your priority is lifting the human flourishing of your, of your people and your government, what are the things that you can material effect that will do that, proven mathematically? Now, it's not as good as Harry Seldon's psychohistory, but it's actually pretty good. Now, does that mean you're going to automatically flourish? And the answer is, of course not. You might have physical security problems that are overwhelm that, or you might have political instability that, that overwhelms that. But it is one tool in one, in one part of the complex of governance to guide that. And it's actually been a very, very successful tool. So again, I go back to the talking about countries in um, Central and, and Northern Europe where they actually went to school on the model 
and really applied it. And because they were also graced with the, the, with the, uh, with the luck of now being part of NATO and really being in a, in a, a political, um, uh, a, uh, a geopolitical envelope where they were really kind of in a sanctuary, they could focus on economic freedom and they made enormous uh, and uh, productive and incredible um, progress. You know, and we've seen the converse as well. We've seen countries that tremendously declined in economic freedom um, and seen the consequences of that. But again, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean a country can't be powerful. With, you can have zero economic freedom and still be powerful as a country. North Korea is a great example. North Korea is the least economically free place on earth, right? If you want to be poor, I don't know, you look like somebody might be happy being completely destitute. I don't know why. Maybe it's just that look. But move to North Korea. They might throw you out, but, but they might let you in. But, but yet, North Korea has arguably the fastest growing and uh, nuclear force on the earth. Right? This is something where in 1945, the United States had to spend billions of dollars, percentages of our GDP, to create nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And the poorest country in the world today could put you know, Oppenheimer to shame. But that's because the, the president of Korea can just literally direct every resource in the country to one specific thing. Russia has an incredibly low level of economic freedom now. It's fighting in a war with the Ukraine. It can continue to do that because the, because the president could just move money around the way he wants. So, so again, it's not magic, but if you look at all the other, the other things, it is a very, very powerful tool. And it's a way to hold, it's a way to um, hold people accountable, but it also gets to the really important issue of transparency. Transparency is such a critical element in good governance. One of the greatest attacks on economic freedom was actually done by the Chinese. And there's one element of the index of economic freedom which is, more, which is more subjective than another, and that's the corruption index. Uh, and the corruption index uh, and, the, and the ease of government index are both, have to be somewhat subjective because the, it's very, very difficult to, to, to quantitatively measure those things. The Chinese actually went to work on the organizations that produced corruption and ease of business doing index, trying to politically influence them to raise China's score. And of course, this absolutely corrupts the, the index. So, so part of the index, we actually had to find other, other ways to do that. So transparency and accountability paired with, with the opportunity to make po sensible policies is an incredibly powerful tool. So let me just finish on this, and I'm happy to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about, particularly if it has anything to do with movies um, or, or music, would be cool, uh, all kinds of music, any, anything's good, um, or television, that'd be fine too. Um, or even politics. But um, we now have this kind of debate in the, in the modern world because in many ways, we are still in that world of post-1995, trying to really figure out how we're all organized. I mean, we, we don't have the clarity of the Cold War, and maybe, maybe that's not norm. You know, there are huge portions of history when people struggled over each other in, in, in undefined and complicated ways, and that was more normal than not. Um, but we're still struggling to figure out how do we protect and, and engage in human flourishing in, in the modern world. And, and now because of the rise of China, we have um, a, a different kind of Mackean debate, which has kind of muddied the wor water between the idea of, well, free markets are good, let's just have me free markets that solves all our problems, and, and preserving and employing the idea of economic freedom. And there's this, you know, during the Cold War it was easy because China, um, Russia was a military power, but largely it wasn't an economic competitor. Uh, and not only was it not an economic competitor, we almost did zero business with the Soviet bloc, right? So we, we almost lived in two separate worlds. So it was really not hard to focus on free markets because the people that weren't doing free markets at all, they were like on the other side of a wall and we never talked to them. So we really didn't kind of face that challenge. But now we have this challenge where we have a country like China, which is in many ways an aggressive and destabilizing power but it's not only a, um, an aggressive power, it's also a massive economic power, one who does a lot of economic activity with the rest of the world. So we, we thought that free markets were gonna be the answer to all this because we, you know, we had this terrible debate between the, the panda huggers. So, um, okay, she looks like a panda hugger, right? 
I mean, you might not be a panda hugger, it doesn't matter, it's just for, right? But she looks, she looks like the kind of person that would hug people, right? So the panda huggers were, hey, look, don't worry, China's becoming rich. And when China becomes rich, it's gonna be a stakeholder in the economic system, it's gonna be the stakeholder in free markets, it will normalize, it'll be a normal country like everything else, everything will be fine, right? And then we have the, the we had that panda haters, and this guy's obviously a panda hater, because he has a mustache, right? So all people with mustache are by nature more aggressive, right? So the panda haters said, what are you out of your mind? He says, China's run by the Chinese Communist Party. When they become rich and famous, they're gonna take all that power and they're gonna use it to beat the heck out of all of us. So the panda huggers were fighting the panda haters. Now the panda huggers are pr pretty much hugging the panda haters, because like you guys are right. But it's gotten to this issue of, um, of how do we deal with the good of free markets where, the, where one of the countries, which is intimately involved in the system of global economics, doesn't really believe in, in free markets. And, and, and what's complicated the debate somewhat is but there are kind of two schools here. There is a school of thought, obviously not this one, where, where the idea of economic freedom uh, and, and, and a more libertarian approach to economic activity and governance, it, they think it's just wrong. They actually believe in centralized government, um, in more centralized economic activity, in very uh, aggressive industrial policies, for, because that is a better pathway to assuring the equity of distribution of, of wealth and, and, and responsibility. Now, with the, and, there, and it comes in many, many forms, but it shares one thing is, is that we have to have centralized control so we make sure that the panda huggers and panda haters each get equal time, right? And, and they don't like free markets. And uh, using, for them, using the China debate is a way to push really an ideological, economic, political agenda that they've always wanted. That, that people should have, that, that, you know, Atlas Shrugged is wrong, you know, and, and you know, John Galt was the bad guy, and the, and the good guys were the ones that were trying to control everything. Um, then there are people that actually understand the, the importance of the free markets and how arguably the extension of free markets has done more to improve human flourishing than any other activity. That more human beings have been lifted out of poverty and been given opportunities in, in the modern world because of free markets than any other thing in human history, more than the inventing you know, farming or inventing money or any war of conquest, free markets have done more to make life better for humans on the planet than anything else. And they want to preserve that, but they also don't want to, to see that system exploited, undermined by, um, either by China or Russia or other malicious and destabilizing activities. And for them, the question is, is how can you preserve the goodness of the ideas of economic freedom, but also protect yourself against the malicious exploitation? Those are two very, very different debates. And I think the first, the first thing you have to decide is, which camp are you in? And then you can start to have honest debates about what are the best policies to, to promote economic policies that you think that would make, would make better for, for yourself, for your community, and your country.